Hey, welcome back to Clean Cut, where we can talk about the truth about just about anything, as long as we use logic and common sense. This season we're talking about Mary, the mother of Jesus, and last time we went over some reasons to believe that Mary is perpetually virgin. This time, we'll look at the main reasons that people have used to deny this claim and see how they fare by comparison. These are the central ones. Number one. First, some people cite this verse from Matthew, which we talked about last time, saying that because it uses the word till she brought forth her firstborn son, that must mean that after bringing him forth, she then did have sex with Joseph. They claim that the use of the word until represents the limit of a statement, and that it directly indicates that a certain state of affairs, in this case the virginity of Mary, comes to an end afterwards. There are two problems with this objection. First, using the word until doesn't necessarily mean that afterwards you will definitely do a different thing. We know this from ordinary speech and the way that we use the word. For example, I could say, I refuse to drink prune juice until the day I die. Well, does that mean that after I die, I'll immediately start drinking prune juice? Of course not. However, more importantly, the New Testament doesn't use the word this way either. For instance, for he must reign until he hath put all his enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15.25 Does this passage mean that after Jesus has put all his enemies under his feet, then he doesn't reign anymore? Well, no, that's absurd. So this first objection doesn't work. Number two. Secondly, from the same verse in Matthew, some people point out the use of the word firstborn son, saying that in Greek, which the New Testament was originally written in, there is a term for only son, which isn't used in the Bible. Therefore, Jesus must be the first of multiple. However, in Hebrew culture of the time, the word firstborn referred to more than just when you were born and how many siblings you had. It was a reference to a person who had a particular role within the family, in much the same way that we use the term heir now. The term firstborn just refers to the social standing and inheritance rights of a person, not to whether there were other children afterwards. Just as a person can be the heir without having any siblings, so they can be a firstborn without having any siblings, so this isn't a very strong objection either. 3. Finally, the following verse is cited as evidence that Jesus had brothers. Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary, and his brethren James, and Joseph, and Simon, and Jude, and his sisters? Are they not all with us? Whence therefore hath he all these things? Matthew. 13, 55 to 56. Well, the teachings of the church are that these aren't children of Mary just because the words brethren and sisters are used. Instead, a couple of different explanations are usually suggested. First, according to the Proto-Evangelium of James, these people were children of Joseph, not Mary, from a previous marriage. However, I don't think that's likely. The more common explanation today is that these were people who were members of the extended family of Jesus, cousins, or other extended kinsmen. Now, the typical response to these explanations is to say that the Greek language used in earlier versions of the New Testament writings uses the word for brother and a different word for cousin. The implication, it seems, is that because Greek has a word for cousin, therefore the Greek word for brother can't be referring to anything except literal biological brothers. The problem with this response is that the Greek word for brother, which is used in this verse, is used to mean lots of other things that aren't literal brothers in other parts of the New Testament alone. For example, Matthew 5.47 uses the same Greek word to refer to people you personally like. Matthew 23.8 uses it to refer to fellow disciples. Matthew 25.40 uses the same word to refer to the least. Luke 10.29 uses it to refer to your neighbor. Acts 3.17 uses it to refer to people of the same country as yourself, and Revelation 22.9 refers to the prophets using this word, among other examples that could be given. It's not good to get caught up in, well, they could have used this other word and didn't kind of reasoning. That's mostly just an argument from silence. You're saying that because the Bible doesn't explicitly refute your interpretation of the text, that you must be right. That's not valid reasoning. The point is that this term for brethren was elastic. It was used to apply to all sorts of things that weren't literal biological siblings, so there's no reason to think it was being used for literal biological children of Mary in this case. However, there's also another problem with this response to the Catholic position. 
Neither Jesus nor any of the people talking about him in that group were speaking Greek at the time. They were speaking Aramaic, and in the Aramaic speech of that time and place, there was no precise term for specifying that someone was your cousin. At most, you might be able to say that someone was your uncle's son, or something along those lines. But neither Hebrew nor Aramaic were languages that were built with precision in mind. Usually words meaning brethren or kinsmen would be used to describe anyone who didn't have some special title within the extended family. And that overall method of speech would carry over into the Greek translation as well, which, because it was the Gospel of Matthew, was mainly written to be read and understood by a Jewish audience. In short, there's no strong reason to think that the word brethren implies literal sons of Mary, or the word sisters implies her literal daughters. And it would need to be strong evidence to indicate that she had a vow of virginity and broke that vow after being chosen by God to give birth to his son. So, in the end, the arguments against the perpetual virginity of Mary are generally pretty weak and based on misunderstandings of the biblical texts and what they mean. Next time... How many Christians believe in Mary's perpetual virginity? That's all for now, so keep asking questions, and thanks for watching.